Thoughts on Black History in Tennessee. Um, I'm Stephanie Davis, and I'm on the community engagement team at the Tennessee State Museum. And thank you all for being here with us. Um, as a poet myself and a poet enthusiast, I've seen the power of poetry to reflect movements, memorialize moments in history, celebrate and commemorate. So I'm very excited about tonight's program and I'm thrilled to have these three amazing poets joining us tonight. In a moment, I'll introduce them before they share their words and we'll follow that with a discussion about being an artist, being a black artist in Tennessee and we'll open up for questions from attendees afterwards. Um, a few reminders before we get started. Please make sure that you're muted. You could do that by checking the bottom of your screen in the middle where the mute button is located. If you have any questions at all and any questions for our poets, you can send us a message um, in the chat bar and you'll see that chat bubble at the bottom. Click on that and from the list of options, please select all panelists and any questions for our poets will be answered at the end. We'll also have a link to a survey at the end. And if you don't mind filling that out, that would be greatly appreciated. So let's get started. Our first poet is Cameron Mitchell. Cameron L. Mitchell is the actor laureate of Murfreesboro and a well-versed spoken word artist. He is founder of Free Fire, an organization of spoken word artists who engage the community with a blend of poetry, theatrics, and transformation. In addition to serving as a mentor with Southern Word, Cameron has performed poetry to open conferences and events for NAACP, Creative Exchange, Lynx Inc., Oz Arts, the Civil Rights Museum, and Vanderbilt University, to name a few. As a Thrive recipient, he has produced the one-man show Blackbird and curated the ensemble performance Infamy. Cameron has worked with various theatrical groups, including Nashville Children's Theater and Ghost. As a member, as a Memphis native and graduate of Middle Tennessee State University, Cameron seeks to transform the community through words and performance. Please welcome Cameron. I thank you for that welcome. This first poem I want to introduce to you all is called Metanoia, Black Kings. Black Kings to Kings is his dream. Black Kings to Kings is his dream. Black Kings to Kings is his dream. I never knew a sweet dream until I saw this queen. Forge the prayers that never expire. You are not just a piece of meat, but you are the prime cut from man's rib protecting the heart. Don't forget that, ladies. Don't move out the way. Let the world curve around your bodies. Don't worry about the other nine. You are the top 10, your highnesses. Hidden in high heaven, holding him in heart. You created your future in your womb, spoken life to it, birthed it. Wasn't easy and never will be, but your stretch marks are just the tiger stripes reminding your womb is a place where stars are born because you are a nebula queen. So remember to let the world curve around your bodies, black queens. Remember to wait patiently for your king. Boys muster many seeds, but don't have the resolve of a mustard seed. I said boys muster many seeds, but don't have the resolve of a mustard seed. Real men, kings, sit six feet tall with Goliath high dreams, who don't fret being a gentleman with moxie. These gentleman hands would generate a generation of giant slayers, slitting the throat to my black is beautiful being overqualified and underqualified for equal opportunity. Let that bleed out. Let metanoia bleed in. That means changing your state of mind before it becomes a landmine for your dreams. Metanoia for melanin kings. Metanoia for melanin queens. Metanoia for melanin kings. I said change the state of mind to realize your dreams. Metanoia for melanin kings. Metanoia for melanin queens. Metanoia for melanin Kings, I said, change the state of mind to realize your dreams. Thank you, thank you. All right, so I wrote that piece because, you know, it's something that I feel like could be very encouraging to our community. That's Noya again was the word meaning, changing the state of mind. 
Next, I'm going to share with you guys a poem that I feel like um, is very interesting. And I, I do hope that you open your ears to listen. I call this poem Ghost Effect. Human beings in the dark. What's the dark to the night? A night to the slave. What's a cross to a Christian who fears everything but God? I wake to the plantation of the mistress, cotton colored woman. Her parties make black boys mistakes feel equal. She sees them as servant though to everyone else he is slave. She teaches him how to spell blessings and how to count them. Beautiful God fearing picture of white woman teaching black child. Her husband, she delights him, but he delights in irresponsible power. So he introduces her to his, his world. That night I dream. I miss the dream. I see a woman barefoot in a Southern white Baptist kitchen, a scarlet apple topside, worms riding inside, but the apple looked immaculate. There's something insidious about this picture. She bites a mouthful. Something demonic settles at the bottom of her heart. Her kindness falls into a deep sleep awaiting a kiss, but the prince is already sleeping next to her. Mold growing inside her morals. I start to panic. She looks at me out for blood, I wake. The house smells of rotten apples. I see the mistress, but I do not see her shadow. Air thick with eerie. She hasn't smiled in six days. My movements feel threatened by her arch glare. I ask her, what will you teach me today? She says, promptly, your place. That night I dream. I see black living room white woman. She sees shadows, but she cannot see them as people, nor can she hear God. The dark speaks articulate. She knows Darwinism does not agree with Christianity, but her insides are only partial to scripture. She only reads parts of scripture. History told one way is only part of the picture. I didn't know both sides are affected by slavery. True, the mind of a slave is altered forever, but to one who owns a human, who does she become? Her mind breaking because this is not how mama raised her. Mama taught her to treat people equal. Be nice, be noble, be not ungodly. But it's too late. Her mind dehumanizing to slave mastery, a poisonous sip, a whip has slithered into the tree of her palm telling her a black boy will not surely die. She reaches for me. I reach for her until I realize she's reaching for my neck. There's something bothering me about this picture. I wake to marks on my enslaved body that were not there yesterday. I notice her bitterness is different. The way she speaks is inhuman. Her spirit vanishing between the walls, gliding the halls possessed like the same way Satan glided the halls of heaven, looking for angels to demonize, where halos become handcuffs. There is still something disturbing me about this picture. It's as if it's looking at me. You know, as the mistress started growing old, I wondered, did she often find herself trying to piece her lack of love life back together? A happiness that is torn songs. It's hard to be a noble wife when you own a wife. This ghost story is real, unfortunately. Frederick Douglass saw his mistress fall victim to slave mastery, perhaps a mental illness, but we wouldn't know because mental illness hadn't been discovered yet. All we know is a lingering presence, a ghost over her shoulder. I shudder to think those apparitions van vanished years ago, but I find her voice ventriloquist through generations reappearing in mental unstable mass shootings saying the voices made me do it. Soldiers hallucinating conditioned to only see shadows, not people. Boys that want to wear white sheets for Halloween nights, white sheets that grow up haunting neighborhoods, AKA KKK. I believe in ghost stories, but see, I got some real Christians in Memphis, Tennessee that taught me not to fear them. So tell those terrorists in white coats, we're breaking boundaries. Their scare tactics can do the most. We only fear one spirit, that's the Holy Ghost. We will paint a picture 
a new narrative. Because they say a picture is worth a thousand words. But like DeWitt Jordan, we will paint a thousand words worth every ancestor that died for this. Thank you. Thank you all. I hope you guys enjoyed those poems. And yes. Thank you, Cameron. That was that was amazing. Um, thank you for sharing your words with us. Um, our next poet up is Kashif Andrew Graham. Kashif Andrew Graham is a writer and theological librarian at the Vanderbilt Divinity School. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree in English Honors Literature and Spanish Language and Literature from the City University of New York. He moved to Tennessee in 2014 to pursue a Master's of Arts and Church Ministry from the Pentecostal Theological Seminary in Cleveland, Tennessee. As a self-described New Yorker living in the South, he enjoys writing poetry on his collection of vintage typewriters. You can follow him at KAG Writes on Instagram. He is currently at work on a novel about an interracial gay couple living in East Tennessee. Join me in welcoming Kashif Andrew Graham. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm very excited to be here tonight. Um, my first poem is entitled For Ida B. Wells Barnett and Mary Church Terrell, uh, a poem in five parts. Part one, speak dispassionately. But what are the quiet ways to say a man was lynched today? Fat rat, warm bodied thing obstructing the narrow end of a megaphone. They made the circuits, serving black death to white lives as easy pablum until they could no more. Part two, don't bite the white hand that feeds you. Tired teeth closing down on Jim Crow's flesh. She took a bite out of crime. Cast out white devil returned with two more. Black woman, five feet short, tossed out on her ass. Shit dirt icing a dress bought on credit. Shredded stockings revealing legs that have carried for whatever the unit of measure is for the movement of black woman. Shawl torn like a veil exposing a back bent but not broken against whatever unit of measure could describe the combustible pressure that meets their spines and shoulder blades. Textured nest egg updo now askance, no longer able to shield from whatever the unit of measure is for the colorless violence that attacks their minds on the crest of airwaves. Part three, the race problem is your problem. A colored woman wakes up in a white world, asks up to the Caucasoid God, what must I do to be saved? Answer beats down from an angry golden disc, arise, get cultured, see the world. Part four, they will die young, gifted, and colored, their bodies having seen the years, but their minds yet unfolding like a red paper crane heading back to flat to the beginning to know what else they might be. Part five, in the end, our blessed Mary sustained the sorrow cord. What heights could I have attained had it not been for my race? This next poem is for John Lewis. For John Lewis, today I learned that giants are small, one small defiance, a foot on a bridge. How could you have known that we would all walk with your wind? We were with you, gay, straight, queer, black, white, Asian, Latinx, in that final crossing over. The round curves of your last earth home draped in a struggling flag as your body crossed the John Lewis Bridge to Canaan. I believe because you believed. This next poem was published late last year in the Nashville scene. Sleeping Brianna. Sleeping Brianna, sleeping brown beauty in a silk bonnet, they stormed in like Kentucky weeds. Silent death pellets showered your resting place, bringing your prince to his knees. Woman's day, a black woman's day is hard. A black woman's day is long. This black woman's day is done. Sleeping brown beauty. Ain't no bonnets needed in heaven. I saw you, my sweet Amaud, fall like lightning. 
Daddy Crow jumped from the hunting van, little Jim looming over your curled raven body. Look, Daddy, ain't a dead nigger a good nigger? In any revolution, everybody's got a way. Some go down to the crooked streets, say his name, Tony McDade. Some sit down to the warning letter, each key's depression, a crack to oppression. Simply put, dear sirs, justice for Brianna. Some go deep into stylish pocketbooks, funding freedom in their own quiet way. But hear me well, the universe is calling everybody to the door. The revolution continues even while you're away, though it is missing your heart, your hands, your riptide chance. Why would you want to be absent on the day when we all overcome? Go back to the field. Your body knows the way. Find the lonely plowshare waiting upright for you. Hear yourself work singing. We shall overcome soon and very soon. This next collect collection is uh, from my reinterpretation, revindication, if you will, uh, of scripture. And I have my own uh, biblical translations. Um, so this is Luke 10 verses three through six. This is from the Bible for the parents of black children. And his mother said to him, you leave me, go out into a world that sees black and sees enigma. Remember not to wear a hoodie or peek through a construction site or fall asleep in your car or whistle near a white woman. I tell you what I tell you so that I may feel the gentle heaves of your chest as you rest tonight. John chapter three, verses three through five from the activist Bible. Jesus said, I'm telling you the truth. No one can see the reign of justice unless they are born again by protest, learning corporally the experience of the poor, black, queer. But how, Nicodemus asked, for I cannot bodily become poor, black, queer. And Jesus answered, you must be born again. That is by the way of the voices of truth spoken throughout the unjust ages, your rebirth is on the road, get going. Psalm 51 verses five, for I was born into white supremacy and into white supremacy did my parent conceive me. These next poems are about black experience. What do we do in ordinary time? In that great flat of space, when the world seems normal, when black stay where black should, do we widen our eyes to the small daily viol violences, widen our minds to that great racist sorting hat? Ah, right then, black helpless poor. Poetic Juneteenth. I want my poems to bring you news of freedom, ball and chain falling behind, noisy musical reminder of bondage past, stepping out from the sun burning working squares, join me under the ancient shade tree, words like a glass of cool lemon tea, come now baby, we're bound to be free. If all you know of black life is black death, then you have missed a, mil a milky moon, slept through a night of stars, Failed to grasp your lover's balmy palm by the black velvet river, fireflies announcing the night. You have been dead, dead to it all. These next poems are about not only the black experience, but the black boy or a black boy experience or a set of black boy experiences. Deliverance. Black boy, country bucking, rainbow raindrops on his head. Dance, boy, dance into your deliverance. Dance, boy, dance, into your deliverance. Don't black gay boys deserve to be wooed too, to turn on our heels like rejected girl Mary, sudden wonder at the appearance of a man we love, Rabboni, he's alive and he wants to marry me. What to do about intimacy lost, about black boys cast down with thunderous silence into a crushed velvet hell, about archives of pain, about inkwells of quiet, about his own fire, about this stretching night, 
about warmth brought to him by him, limb, loving limb. What must black boys do to tell you pain, pull aside cool car coats, uncover cavernous side wounds, in body inroads, miles mined by violence, or turn to you the palms, coconut meat flesh, impaled by the great American God who moves among us as lover, brother, friend? Or can they quietly say, I hunger, I thirst, and sit down to bread and milk and honey? Don't call a black boy strong unless you are there to ladle him from the vat of nighttime tears, lotion his salty body in the stations of the cross, wrap him with linen strip by strip by strip. Unless you are there to entomb this boy in warmth and kisses till the first crack of morning, unless you are there to lather, rinse, repeat. And this will be my last poem. Uh, this is from my first collection of poetry called Frontiers. This is Ode to Black Young Men. Ode to Black Young Men who die in the flower of their youth. Some take their own lives into their calloused hands and mangle them until they are as disfigured as black shiny bodies or stone them until they can no longer become human. Ode on young black men who war to find themselves but find weakness and sickness instead. Ode on young black men who take things into their hands that don't belong there. They die in courts, in the backs of police cars, in schools, and in tubs, and on trees, and in diners where they are told that he does not love them, where cruel jokes are revealed and life loses its sense, and easily slip they into reverie on life, on meaning, and signification, and they fall anon into disrespect and fail to bow before the grandees and dukes and marquises because a sconce covers the light of life. They lose youthful laughter and potions of eternal juvenility evade them. They imagine home in their absence and bursts of hot hope burn through their brains and friends hug their families and give condolences and pour blame onto themselves spilling scalding creamy porridge onto their own laps and they imagine them heavy sick with grief and entering into odd apostrophes with dreary tombstones and buying their scents again and anon every summer and crying blood and sweating excrement and bowing on their white yellow and red and black knees ode to young black men whom death claims long before its time and they simply cannot go Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. Um, our third poet to close out our reading portion would be Sianna Rouse. Sianna Rouse is the author of the chapbook Vanta Black, published by Third Man Books, 2017. Her poetry has appeared in Oxford American NPR Music, The Account, Talking River, Gabby Journal, and other publications. She is poetry editor of Word Peace. Along with poet Kendra DiColo, Rouse hosts the literary podcast Reverb. Please join me in welcoming Sianna Rouse. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for hosting this uh, in Tennessee State Museum and Kashif and Cameron, it is good to share the screen with you and to hear your voices tonight. Um, I'm going to start actually with a poem by Arna Bonto, who is a, a poet of the Harlem Renaissance, who was the head librarian at Fisk University, and so a Tennessee poet, uh, also writer in residence, and just, you know, 
someone that we celebrate here in Nashville. It is called Length of Moon. Then the golden hour will tick its last and the flame will go down in the flower of briefer length of moon. We'll mark the sea line and the yellow dune. Then we may think of this, yet there will be something forgotten and something we should forget. It will be like all things we know, a stone will fall, a rose is sure to go. It will be quiet then, and we may stay long at the picket gate, but there will be less to say. This first poem is in my chapbook, and it's called On the Sidewalk of Troy, Tennessee. 1904, I wrote it in response to reading about a, um, a lynch mob that was following this man uh, in Troy, Tennessee, which is Western Tennessee. On the sidewalk of Troy. Black man walk on the sidewalk, dread on the sidewalk. Good speed, God speed, God save him as he walks. White girl on the sidewalk, Cross to the other side, man, drop into the ditch, man. Don't look into her eyes, man, on the sidewalk. Ditch the pavement, don't pave away, that's not for you. I mean the ditch, the ditch is for you. Walk down and low, eyes bowed. Walk low and down, step around, I pray. Step around or else your body lined in chalk. I said step aside or get chalked or hanged. Neck cracked in permanent supplication by the sidewalk sway, sway, or stay, black man, on the sidewalk, split the altar of her ego on the pavement where you walk. I mean, pave a way that frees her from this lie, this old snake still whispers, still slides, still makes her eat that peculiar fruit. You must walk on the sidewalk. Let me hear the click and clack of your heels on the sidewalk. Drive your stake through humanity and claim it as you walk, head erect, sun and eyes forward and never to the side. Walk. Uh, this next poem is called Yes, I Say to the Glass of Bourbon. And that title comes from a poem by Natasha Trekaway called Southern Pastoral in which she has a dream that she's with the fugitive poets who are a bunch of white dudes at Vanderbilt and in Nashville who call themselves the fugitive poets. Robert Penn Warren, several other poets are in it and they were mighty unkind to a lot of black poets and mighty unkind to black people in some of their works as well. And uh, so she says one line in the poem, yes, I say to the glass of bourbon and so this poem borrows from Natasha Trethaway. Yes, I, yes, I say to the glass of bourbon. Yes, the South begs to dark brown soil, rich brown and even black when wet and dripping. Yes, she salivates over her land. Yes, the South says in poems about sweet magnolia and tulip poplar, their brown torsos carving roots into brown earth. Yes, it says to brown pigskin on autumn Saturdays, the backs of brown leaves cracking beneath brown leather boots. Yes, to tailgating, browning steak. Yes, to hats off. Yes, to hands on chests. Yes, to history and liberty. And no, to football players, brown knees on turf. Yes, I say to the glass of bourbon, the brown brew, brown liquor, brown sugar, brown honey fire in my throat. In the beginning is white dog and the whiskey is clear light. They char white oak to black and wheat for perfection. Brown it down, brown it down to dark Southern confection. To the brown, to the brown. Cheers, the South says to brown. Cheers and yes, and yes, and yes, and always beneath the yes, the loudest echo. No. Um, this is my first time, I think, reading that from my whiskey library, my bourbon library. <laughs> yes, I say to many glasses of bourbon. Bedtime in Mississippi. This was published in the Nashville scene and I wrote it in Mississippi, uh, but it really is a Southern, you know, anywhere in the South really. Bedtime in Mississippi. 
No moments of silence here. Not now or at midnight or when something alarms at 3 a.m. Repetitive rumble of AC just outside the window. The clocks yakety yak each second. The loud red of a truck or a car yowling blue lights, forever bringing some kind of blues. A constant ghost. Whispered truth, bruised needs, pleading for someone to hear her testify. Threadbare synapses stitched into my cortex. A patchwork of questions and fear. Here, the soil speaks through gritted teeth. Here we bite back with our toes, clenching blood, mud. Here the sun pushes us into the ground and down into dusk. The katydids shine their song until its return. Enough of this noise though. I know a South where I was called Oreo from mouths shaped and shaded like mine. What's a black girl not black enough? And I know a pale faced dandelion haired South whose mama wants to know why Katie didn't say all of who I was before she invited me to her first boy girl party. Whoever will she dance with, she asked. What's a girl too black to do? I know a South where I will never go. Even if they say the road is yellow bricked with good intentions, I know no good intentions ever click their heels three times to save a body like me. I know a South so stuck always in mythology, it wants to read me who I am, even in the should be quiet of night. Back to the noise. The radio fuzzing through the wall from another room, locusts in conference at the base of the maple. A pecan strikes the rooftop, and I no longer jump. Only hope it means a wind strong enough to loosen the tree's fist is a wind near enough for relief. The owl inside my brain asks who, 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 all night long. Ahmad Arbery, uh, whose name was mentioned by Kashif, uh, among other names that you know, was um, murdered a year ago in Georgia. And uh, as we all probably know, we didn't really begin talking about it until April, which is when I started writing this poem, but um, the anniversary of his death is actually next week. Um, this poem is called Care. And the epigraph is from um, Ahmad's father. He took his body very seriously always ran and had pride in everything he did. Ahmad Arbery's father to ABC News. Today I braided my hair, massaged the pads of my finger with each slide down these textured strands. Today I also took a bath of bubbles and Epsom salts lit candles that created a wild glow on my skin each time I lifted my leg and watched the bubbles jazz their way back to the water. Today, I listened to Billie Holiday ask a willow tree to weep on her behalf and wished nature worked that way, wished a gardenia could cover some of my mistakes. Also today, I drank a cup of tea, Earl Grey. I read Wanda Coleman poetry, counted how many bottles of water I consumed. I napped. I ran a few miles in bright clothes. I have cried for trees before, but I never thought to ask one to drop its leaves for me. Today, I stopped by the sugar maple before untying my running shoes. I know you don't have weeping in your name, I said, but perhaps you might at least tremble. I sat on one of its roots today. I repeated names many of us now know to say, and we both shook, the maple in me. I pulled loudly on oxygen. She let me sit there, breathing. And I would like to close out my time. Thank you for listening and being here with us today. And uh, I hope you'll stay as we have a conversation as well. Um, I'm going to close it out with a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks, who actually is a Chicago poet. It was a Chicago poet when she was alive, uh, but she actually had a pivotal time at Fisk University that um, 
had her join the Black Arts Movement shortly afterwards and just really shaped her poetry from that point forward. And uh, so she also has a great Tennessee connection that she spoke about often because it was a powerful, challenging, but good time for her at Fisk University with other Black poets at a conference. And so I want to read this poem that she wrote after that conference, and it's called The Second Sermon on the Wolfland. One, this is the urgency, live, and have your blooming in the noise of the whirlwind. Two, salve, salvage in the span, endorse the splendor, splashes, stylize the flawed utility, prop a malign or failing light, but know the whirlwind is our commonwealth. Not the easy man who rides above them all, not the jumbo brigand, not the pet bird of poets, that sweetest sonnet shall straddle the whirlwind. Nevertheless, live. Three, all about are the cold places. All about are the pushmen and jeopardy, theft. All about are the stormers and scramblers, but what must our season be which starts from fear? Live and go out, define and medicate the whirlwind. Four, the time cracks into furious flower, lifts its face all unashamed, and sways in wicked grace, whose half black hands assemble oranges as Tom Tom hearted, goes in bearing oranges and boom. And there are bells for orphans, and red and shriek and sheen. A garbage man is dignified as any diplomat. Big Bessie's feet hurt like nobody's business, but the stand, but she stands bigly under the unruly scrutiny, stands in the wild weed. In the wild weed, she is a citizen and is a moment of highest quality admirable. It is lonesome yet, yes, for we are the last of the loud. Nevertheless, live, conduct your blooming in the noise and whip of the whirlwind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siona. Um, that was wonderful. Um, thank you again, Cameron and Kashif. We'll now move on to a discussion. I'll ask everyone a few questions um, before we move on to any questions from attendees. If anyone has questions, just remember to type them in the chat bar and um, address them to all panelists. My first question would be if you can all describe your experience of being being a black poet, being an artist in Tennessee. What tell tell us what was that like? What challenges have you come across? And what are some accomplishments you you are proud of? And anyone can start. I can uh, start this. Um, I can definitely say it's an interesting place. I feel like we're in this in between kind of place. Um, personally, I didn't really start just this journey of being a poet um, until like 2016. I was doing some writing back in college, but it was really just a way to express myself. And I realized just as a man, uh, even black man, it's like I wasn't very expressive and I wasn't very well at expressing myself uh, with my different emotions and just like things that were coming out of me. Like I didn't know how to really like make those happen. And so, yeah, definitely on a college campus, I was able to write, but I felt like I needed to share the words that were coming out of me. I feel like they were something that could be used in the community. And I felt that leadership calling me to that place. And so uh, being a spoken word artist, I, I feel like I have been able to have conversations through my art that were difficult for me to communicate beforehand. Beforehand, it was very difficult for me to talk about things that I was passionate about or that I really had concerns about. And it's like, how do I get people to talk about these issues and bring them to the table to really like provoke their thoughts and, and raise questions about things that we're missing. And I feel like poetry 
uh, Spoken Word has really given me that platform to do that. Uh, as you can see, some of the poems I have are very controversial. Some can be a little uh, strong and it's, it's necessary because, you know, life we're dealing with right now is very real. It's not, you know, a little movie where everything ends with a happy ending, but it's like things are happening and we just sweep things under the rug. So I feel like being a poet in Tennessee, where we are right in the thick of so much, you know, racial issues and, uh, you know, gentrification going on, uh, redlining, I mean, so many uh, gender issues, like we're in a place where we really need to talk about that stuff. And I'm glad to be here, even though it's frustrating sometimes, I'm glad to be here. So. You know, um, Tennessee is a state of rich rhythms and language, you know, music, especially in Nashville, but I think all across the state is important. And so I think to be a poet in a place where language and musicality and voice then therefore matters, right? Because whether it's way back in the day, people playing banjos, there still was this voice and message that was being proclaimed and often it was speaking to hardships or um, injustices uh, and uh, the blues, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a rich part of Tennessee history and to be in a place where we value language and art it's just wonderful i i've been in nashville for nearly 20 years now and i would say i've been i started writing poetry when i was a child but i really began to call myself a poet here and there's a community of people who value voice and stand together and support each other and um yeah, you know, I think of us as a language city here in Nashville, not just a music city. And so it's 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 been incredible to uh, be in a place, and, and just as Cameron was saying, a, a place that's not without its issue, without its struggle, without its tortured history. Um, you know, there's times when I look at a tree and I feel comfort, and times that I look at it and wonder whose neck was cracked there. Um, but we're also a rich history of the civil rights movement and the fight and uh, people gathering to train and learn how to speak against injustice. And so it, it really is, has been a wonderful place to come into my voice and um, share my voice and be supported and held, especially in the poetry community. I mean, my poetry people are here in Tennessee. I love it. I have to second that um, what Sienna was just saying about being held and um, my literary community is here as well. Um, and to speak to Cameron's point, um, poetry for me really began when I moved to East Tennessee in 2014 and I was in seminary and uh, it was just I was working through a lot of existential issues. I mean, so yes, I think a lot of my early poetry was probably very angsty, but that's okay. You know, it has its place. Um, and I needed another way to express sort of the turmoil on the inside uh, that was sort of taking place in my interior life. Um, so I really found support, especially when I moved here to Nashville. I will also say that my form, um, I really mostly write in short form. Um, the the sort of pieces at the beginning and end of my time were my longer were longer pieces, but uh, it really came out of a, ho a hobby that I developed when I moved to Tennessee, which is collecting typewriters. So I would just drive the back roads in East Tennessee and find these amazing typewriters and clean them up, and then I just started writing poetry on these library card catalogs or catalog cards. Um, so I think really. Like, just to think that the machines came from Tennessee, um, you know, so many of my supporters are here and my peers in Tennessee. So I definitely feel very supported as an artist. 
Um, and also by, you know, writers collectives like Porch, Tennessee, you know, I've, I found great support there as well. Um, so yeah, I think of course, Nashville is not without, I love that Sienna, when you said that place, um, it's amazing to just like walk over to Fisk. And if you need inspiration, just stand in the middle of the campus and think about the years, you know, so many names and people that we know walk into the library, look at the first editions. You know, um, it's just, it's incredible. Whenever I I'm, I'm really have no shortage of inspiration, I can walk downtown by the Woolworths, you know, lunch counter or um, go to TSU or something. So yeah, I feel definitely very held as an artist and feel like there's so much fodder here. Thank you all for that. Um, my next question is, are there any misconceptions about being a Black poet in Tennessee or the South in general? I, I might just jump in first and I'm, I'll just, the first thing that comes to my mind is, I think it's that Black poets are always writing about, either always writing about Black experience um, or that we're sort of bound to that or that I mean, this is kind of age old, like this, you know, seems like it should go without saying that we are writing for like, I'm, if I write a poem and it's posted to my Instagram, it's published somewhere, I'm somehow speaking about the black experience, you know, that it's everybody's experience. And, and then if you deviate from that, you get called like Sienna was saying an Oreo or you, you know, so it's like, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions is that everything that you're writing is about black experience. I think some things are about other things, human experience, um, love. Yes, that may be, I may be living that out through my sense of blackness, but it's about more than just, you know, um, black experience. So I guess that's one of the first things that I would say is, is definitely, I think, a misconception. I think there is, you know, I don't, I, I keep wondering, is it, is it the South perhaps, but I think maybe for black poets in general, there's that sense that there's a monolith voice and that, uh, that we can, that we do speak for all black people or all Southern black people. Um, and so whatever experiences we're giving, I think we're constantly in the US, not just in poetry, but people are trying to make the black voice one black voice. And um, I hope that we're breaking through that and that people are seeing that um, people of color are not monolith and we have we we come with many different experiences and truths and that there's power in all those voices being proclaimed and so perhaps that is just a south thing but i don't think so i would say maybe for a long time just kind of addressing our racial history of the south felt like very specific to being a black poet in the south but I believe no matter where you are now, you have to recognize that the history that's a part of the, the blood of America is you know, spilled all over America and it, it's, a, it's affecting us all over the US. And so I think that even isn't just contained in the South now, um, but I, I definitely think that was for a long time where people just assumed that these kind of voices and these kind of things that we might write about would just be for Southern Black poets. Yeah. You know, I, I was really uh, thinking about this question. And, you know, one thing that really comes to mind about it is that a lot of people, especially the youth, don't like poetry. At least they believe they don't. And it's because we grow up and we come through these English classes and they have a week or two where they're like, all right, we're going to talk about poetry. 
And it's this old, like, roses are red, violets are blue, William Shakespeare this, and yada, yada, yada. And it's like, William Shakespeare is a great artist. Edgar Allan Poe is a great artist. But here's the thing. A lot of these kids don't even like 90s music. So, you know what I'm saying? They want to hear things that they can relate to. Their music, their generation, what's happening right here, right now. And as great as those poets were back then, they had their issues back then. They had their crowd. And for a lot of people, that crowd is not us. And so a lot of us come up, and I came up in the same way. I didn't really like poetry. I couldn't even hear poetry probably 10 years ago because my ears were not tuned to it. Like, if it wasn't rap, poetry like this, I would not be able to hear you all. But after my ears began to open and realize how great poetry can be and that it can be relatable to me, I heard one person on a college campus, and I mean, her poem struck me. No rhyme words in it, but it was something about the way she portrayed herself through that poem. I felt that. I don't know who she was, but I just remember the feeling that I had. And I noticed that when I go into these schools to teach, I teach with an organization called Southern Word. And the first thing that always comes to mind when we say, hey, we're going to talk about poetry. Like, oh my gosh, I hate poetry. But every time we leave, they're like, when are y'all coming back? Why are y'all leaving in the first place? Like, y'all can stay. We love y'all. Like, don't leave. And they want to hear more about poetry. They want to talk about more poetry. They're writing poems outside of our class and workshops. And so it's like, okay, they do enjoy this stuff. I enjoy this stuff. But it's the way we're presenting it, it's not coming across in a way that they, appre they can appreciate. And it's because we're not... Uh, appreciating their voice and their generation. And I think that's something that we really need to change the narrative on. It's like, how do we accept their voice and, and say that your voice is acceptable and show them that, hey, here are some examples of people who are like you, who relate to issues like you. And I think that really can change the narrative of like poets, because I, I really realized like poetry has been around for a while. Spoken word is just as old as hot chicken in Nashville, but for some reason, everyone's just now finding out about it, right? And it's because, you know, these type of matters. So I, I think, you know, I appreciate the poets that I know who've really been working hard to bring this forward. And, yeah. Thank you for that, Cameron. Um, I was one of those students. <laughs> when I took a poetry class, I was just like, what is this? I hate this. <laughs> and I just <laughs> thought that poetry was one of these things that just the language was so elevated, it wasn't accessible to me until, you know, I experienced different types of poetry and just recognize how versatile and expansive poetry can be. Um, and now look at this. I'm, I'm, poetry all day. <laughs> Stephanie, I'll, I'll just, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Cameron. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. I hated writing growing up, and it's like, I had no idea I was going to become a writer <laughs> in my life. It's like the irony of the situation. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting also, I mean, you have to, I mean, I, as I think about my own development, I mean, you have to see yourself in the poem or in poetry. And then also understand, because the earliest poets that I was exposed to in high school, middle school, high school, um, very few of them were black. I mean, I think Rita Dove, but some, somehow, very conveniently, my English teachers skipped over, you know, um, or they just weren't in the canon. And so, um, but then I think also learning sometimes in, for some poets, how, you know, depending on the period, how subversive it was for them to be writing whether they were writing, you know, in the 19th century, there's a, I'm thinking of a, uh, a black poet, I can't remember his name, but he was writing sonnets. Um, it might have actually been before that, you know, people sort of said, you're alienating your audience, but what they really meant was you shouldn't be writing this, you know? 
And so learning all of that and, you know, how subversive it was sometimes for them to be writing at all, I think attracts me even more because you, the act of writing poetry, you know, for, for some of them is, is, was rebellion, you know? Um, and then also some of, you know, once you understand even I think more of the coded language, for example, County Cullen, because learning that he was queer and then reading some of the poems, I'm like, this is not about a woman, is this, you know? So it makes it all richer. I think learning about the world behind the poetry sometimes can, you know, help to uh, either draw interest or enliven, highlight, illuminate the poem. Sienna, did you have something else to say? No, I mean, this okay. is, I just agree with this whole conversation in that the, the way we teach poetry and, and not, I try not to teach it this way whenever I'm working with students, but it's so terrible often. <laughs> and we're making people dissect a poem or read The Raven, which is a good poem, but that's not the only poetry, so. But I was curious, what broke you for poetry, Stephanie? Do you remember like the poem or the poet? No, I just remember the professor um and he made poetry like he was just like poetry is everywhere he recited um a subway um sign that he noticed coming to work and we discussed whether it was poetry or not so his thing was poetry is not this art that's for this specific rich white old men you know yeah. uh, group of people everyone has access to this and you can be your own voice and be the poet that you want to see and i think that may open me up to what poetry can do and then as i continue to study with this professor that expanded my world even more and then i was exposed to other poets um, like Philip Levine, even though he's not a black poet. Um, and then we got Jericho Brown, um, Terrence Hayes, and all those great poets that I read today. Right. I love that poetry, we all have access to language and we all have access to voice, even if it's sign language or you know how, how we're expressing it may not be vocal. Um, and poetry is this art form that we literally do all have access to. And it's sad that it's often thought of as inaccessible. Um, and I'm glad for groups like Southern Word and um, other organizations that are doing that work to help young people access their voice very early. Because I think it changes everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'll move on to... Next question would be who and what, and bring it back to Tennessee, who and what in Tennessee's history has had an influence on your work and on you? Man. <laughs> I, would, I would say, uh, sorry, Cameron, were you gonna go ahead? Okay, go ahead. Um, I would, I definitely, you know, can never stop talking and singing the gospel of Mary Church Terrell even though there were times that she was kind of problematic, but she um, grew up in Memphis and, you know, to a middle class, upper middle class um, black family and um, was light enough to pass, but elected not to. I wrote about her. So, you know, I, I enjoy, thoroughly enjoyed her autobiography, A Colored Woman in a White World um, and thought, you know, I first saw that when I was an undergrad at CUNY, CUNY Lehman and saw her eyes and on the cover of the book and just thought how you know sad she looked and the title was so sad to me a colored woman in the white world you know the the great realization so to speak um but she is just an incredible uh figure and uh recounts this scene in the autobiography where she is um in germany and on a date uh with a german officer like the whole thing i was like what sis um, on this date with this German office, military officer. And um, they, after the, they, they're, you know, finished at the opera, they start talking 
And she begins to recite the opening lines to the Iliad in classical Greek. And she says, he was transfixed to the spot. Um, and, you know, just, I, I just, yes, I find her cool. And I think she, you know, had so many great adventures, but really she's a pioneer. Um, Ida B. Wells, they, they're, you know, they also, their experiences converge with the um, advent of Jim Crow and riding on the train and Ida B. Wells biting the conductor's hand. Um, so those would be the first two that come to mind. And of course, John Lewis, but uh, absolutely, those are, those are my all time favorites. Yeah, um, I definitely have a few. Um, I know Langston Hughes was definitely a poet that provoked my thoughts with a dream deferred. And as I got older, I, I really began to ponder on that poem. But I would say what, what really got me, you know, some of the poems that and writings that we saw in schools were definitely great. But I took this class in college and we had, there was this book called The Anthology of African-American Literature. The writings that were in that book far exceeded what I perceived about a lot of the, the African-American leaders from our time with, there were things that Langston Hughes wrote that was far better than some of the poems I've been seeing. But one particular person and I've mentioned this in my poem, Ghost Effect, is uh, Frederick Douglass. His writing is so exceptional. And I'm, the way he was able to articulate things through his, his works is just amazing. And what gets me is that he was born a slave. And so to come from this place of being a slave and then being able to write so well that his words hold weight today. You know, I think about you know, my favorite piece written by him was what to the slave is the 4th of July. You know, first of all, the boldness he had to have to share that poem or that speech. And then the way he was able to construct it, that was so just clever. I'm, I'm just amazed at his work and I, I just, He's like a mentor for me, even though he's not currently here, like through his work, through his words, like I feel mentored by the things that he does. And, you know, his autobiography is where I crafted the poem Ghost Effect, where he talked about his um, experience with his mistress, who was actually the one who started teaching him how to read and write. And just her experience of being married to a slave master, it began to change her. And so his perception to see between the lines, you know, a lot of situations you can get frustrated about and we get so angry or so frustrated so much in our emotions, we don't see what's happening, but he was able to notice that she was changing into someone else in that process. Um, you know, he was able to call out the fact that Christianity of America is false. That doesn't mean the Bible is false. To be able to see between those lines, you have to have a very uh, stable mentality to, to see those lines and to see things that are happening that we overlook so easy. And so that mindset with his writing is powerful. And I, I really for myself, try to convey those type of messages. Like, what are we missing on the inside when we get angry and frustrated? You know, we want to show that frustration, but what is it in the middle that can be constructed to move us forward to, that really needs to be said? And that's what I really try to strive for in my writing. It's like that place of things that need to be said, even though it, it may hurt, it may sting a little, but it's going to work out for all of our good in the end. So, yeah. Um, there's so, there's actually a really great rich history in Tennessee, especially when it comes to being African American. And as a child, I grew up in South Carolina, but Ida B. Wells was a hero as a child and still is a hero. 
and so she's got that Memphis Memphis story in her life. Um, <laughs> the the Highlander Folk School is where you know Rosa Parks and King, like all of these people, came to Tennessee to train for this movement, which is really incredible that that was here in our state. But if I were to name maybe the most influential as far as history goes, um, I've written quite a bit about the sit-ins and I got to take some lectures with James Lawson. And I, I just think James Lawson is powerful. And I, I think of things that he said in those lectures often about being, um, you know, peaceful in resistance, uh, organized in resistance and the way that he trained the sit-ins and got those really started. I mean, the first sit-in was technically in, or it was in North Carolina in Greensboro, but um, they were training for them first in Nashville and preparing for them. Uh, North Carolina just happened to do their first one. Uh, but his work there is just so powerful. And, and I think James Lawson is a, a treasure that we have here in the state and he's returned back to Nashville. Um, he's the reason why King came to Memphis. Um, he he and, and then the people that were already in the movement uh, were doing great work uh, and fighting poverty. And, you know, King died here in our state uh, during that march that they organized and um, and the, the fight really was very much on the grounds here in Tennessee, even though I, I feel like we hear about other states often when we're talking about the civil rights movement on a national level. Uh, but so much of the fight was organized here in our state, and that very much inspires me. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Urban Thoughts. It was from Memphis, Tennessee. And Urban Thoughts says, one of my favorite writers and poets, James Baldwin, said that we must bear witness to the times. Do you feel the beautiful burden of bearing witness and being an active participant and telling the truth of these times? I, I think that's a, that is such a, there's there so many ways to answer that question and I'll keep it brief because I know we're um, coming down on time, but um, I think that hit me in the face last year, you know, especially as the protests picked up and I started writing, posting more, you know, poems on Instagram. I felt a certain weight that I didn't want to. I was struggling through that. Like I, I, I felt that I needed to tell the truth and depict and say things that people didn't necessarily want to hear, you know, um, as we, you know, the question is asking um, about. I don't know, just bearing, I had to use the N word and I had to wrestle with that because I thought, well, I have all of these new followers and I looked at them as they were coming in. I was like, a lot of them are white. How are they going to handle this? Um, and I had to say, well, you know what? This is really, this is the, the truth, you know, trying to shoot for that poetic truth. Does this feel true? Yes. So I had to write it and I felt a certain, a responsibility um, that I did not want to try to soften the blow for the reader. Um, and not everything was hard, 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 but, you know, I definitely felt that weight. And, um, and then also, I think for me, and that's the last thing I'll say is that it really played out with, um, sometimes having to let that go and say, I need to take care of myself and I can't write. Yes. I felt, I feel like the burden of truth and there are all these people that are, you know, small number of people, but all these people who are waiting for the next poem, but I can't do it right now. So I need to take care of myself and I need to hide from the world and not think about the fact that Ahmad Arbery was, you know, running uh, and pe you know, peeked through a construction site. And on my run that night, there was a construction site right here, you know, near Belmont. And I, it frightened me. And I had to say, I need to go into my apartment and hide, you know? So you know that you have it, you're accountable, I would say to the universe, to to you know the spirit of truth, but um it's something that you know you sort of weigh in the balance. 
I, I want to piggyback on that idea of caring for ourselves because and the poem that I read tonight, Care, I think kind of confronts even having to write about the times because, you know, as I was discovering that I was also wrestling with my own like running in my neighborhood, but I had some physical things too that I had to take care of where I literally did have to take care of my body. And, you know, here, Ahmad Arbery, it's taking care of his body and his body is um, stolen and just, you know, all of those things. And so I really just started the poem thinking about the ways that I needed to care for myself. Um, and then it continued to evolve to be about all the names that, you know, all these names I was saying as I was running um, and thinking about them during that time. But, um, yeah, I beautiful burden is such a good way to phrase that because it is it's a good thing that we are able to speak to as poets we get to kind of spelunk the past and our personal memories our collective history we get to hopefully cast vision into the future personally and collectively and then there's that idea of just being really present as well and so whether that's speaking to my personal times or a collective time. I I think our work is to move through space and time in that way. And um, for sure, for sure, we should be speaking to the now. We should be um, interacting with other voices now, whether that's through music or film or rap or someone that I meet on the corner at a street back when we used to just meet random people <laughs> on the corners. But um, yeah, we we should be going through all of time and space and definitely now. Um, that's where we'll make the impact where people do hear themselves and see themselves in poetry and recognize the power of voice. Um, so it's a beautiful burden. We have to take care of ourselves as we do it. Um, but let's let's do it let's let's continue to do it yeah i definitely feel like what we do is necessary and you know it's interesting that i told myself when i started writing i was like man i hear so many poems that you know but i, I really don't want to be one of those people that's just like all my poems are like about black issues of black people and things like that. I want to write stuff that's just different. But, you know, just like, you know, I've, I've been reading through Jeremiah and I feel like just like Jeremiah, I feel like it's been a fire in my bones that this fire, this, this word needs to come out of me. And me trying to run and just go do random other stuff is just not working. Like there are things things that are coming out of me that need to be said right here, right now, because, you know, America is full of lies. I mean, the, you know, the enemies that we face are full of lies. And it's like that perspective needs to come from us, um, those of us that are witnessing it, those of us that need to see it for what it is, uh, but those of us that need to see the beauty in a lot of these situations as well that are getting covered up. We need to see those things for what it is and you know as just as you know some of them were saying some of these things we we try to hold back because we feel like it might be hurtful or you know what might some of these people think you know especially when it comes to people who are white it's like how might they feel with me talking about this this topic but it's like this is the truth this is what it is we are dealing with these truths every day and it's like, these are problems that we all are supposed to recognize. You know, I realize that slavery, we've thought for so long that slavery is black history. But in actuality, it's also white history. It's American history, right? But it's, it's things that some people do understand that. Some white people understand it, but there are a lot of people, black and white, who don't understand that. There's a lot of people who are living with lies and trying to believe, oh, you know, black people are just lazy. They don't want to work and they just down there, you know, taking up food stamps and taking our tax money for no reason whatsoever. And it's like, you haven't 
lived in those circumstances. You haven't been around those type of people to to judge because you're seeing what's on social media or what's on TV. And we take that and run with it. But we're not hearing the voices in the community. And I feel like poetry has given us has given us a voice to really activate and show the real things that are happening in a beautiful way because we're able to take words and craft them in a way that people can really understand, that people can digest and envision the things that are happening and then feel something from that. Because that's one thing that we're seeing today is like people don't feel anything anymore. Everybody's in this, I don't care mentality. I don't care what happens to them. I don't care what happens to you, yada, yada. It's like, no, we need to start caring. We need to be in a place where we care. That's how we fix things. That's how we move forward with things. And so, you know, I, I feel that we poets, I feel like not just me, but many people feel that same thing. It's like, this is a fire that needs to come out. We got to write and we got to share it. It has to happen. So. I, I also just want to ask, add, um, I think too, if we believe that poetry has power, like something we say and our voice has power out in the world, then we should also believe that what we say has power within us. And so again, we have to go to the page for working through those things, whether we are trying to work through the past, um, our future demise or our present, the things that are going on. Um, I hope that we can trust the power of poetry to do its work within us as writers too. So whether you have a platform to share it, um, yeah, do the work of poetry, do it uh, and, and speak to the times, even if it just stays in your journal, you know, speak to the times because we believe that the power of language can do something to reshape who we are. Great, thank you for that. Um, we're coming up on time, so I'll just close with this last question. Um, what do you love about being a poet? What do you love about being a poet in Tennessee? I can say I enjoy the fact that I get to empower my community. And, you know, being from Memphis, there are a lot of people who have lost hope uh, a light and dreaming has faded for a lot of people. And even for myself, I didn't realize how dim my dreams were until I was able to expand and be around people that helped to sharpen me and really encourage me. And so to see that when I get on social media or when I share a poem and people really say, I enjoyed that, that really spoke to me, that really did something in me. That means a lot because, you know, for me growing up, it didn't feel like my words did anything to anybody. It felt like people just like, Cam, be quiet. You don't know what you're talking about. Yada, yada, you know, go about your way. And it, it just felt like me as a person and then just me as a black man, like my voice didn't just have any weight, didn't have much to it. And so, you know, I thank God that he has put me in this place and there are many ways that we can share our voice, but for me, poetry has given me a way to activate my voice and be comfortable knowing that I do have something worth saying, worth hearing, and people actually listen and actually feel a change happening from that. And so I'm just grateful to be a servant in the arts, helping to change people's lives and uh, change that perspective on things. So and restore that light. Um, I, I love being a poet. I love language and I like playing with it. I've, language is this playground and we can discover things that we wouldn't normally access with language. I think when we're playing on the page um, or flowing, you know, if, if someone is really great at just flowing with language and a spoken word, um, I, I, it's such a joy to, again, play with something that we all have access to that was, that people tried to deny us, you know, people tried to deny black people 
from being able to access language um, and in, in our country and, and I get to play with it now and that and use it to make sense of my life and to perhaps make sense of this world. Um, it's age old. We've been doing that from the beginning of the time. Uh, we have stories, we have religions, we have um, beliefs because people accessed language. And so it's such a gift to be able to do that. And again, to do it in Tennessee that does have a rich history, but also, um, you know, amazing language people like Nikki Giovanni. Um, uh, poets across the ages, current poets, Tiana Clark. I mean, I get to be with Cameron and Kashif and Stephanie and Joshua Moore and Kendra Colo and just all of the voices that are here, um, Nashville and Tennessee. This is this is my my playground <laughs> of poetry. So I, I I love that. I think you know. I mean. I, as you were mentioning those names too, Sienna, I had to think about Nikki Finney, you know, and oh my goodness, the way in which like we became kindred spirits because I, we both identified with this idea of playing with language. And I would say for me, um, growing up as a Jamaican American in New York, going to a school of mostly white kids um, who were from really at all over New York City or their parents had, you know, come from Ireland or their grandparents from Italy, wherever. Um, and they all spoke in sort of different accents. And my sisters and I would go home and sort of play with the accents. You know, we would let the different ways of saying things roll around in our mouths. And it was just, it was a lot of fun. Um, and so I, I've always thought about language as play. Um, and then to speak to Cameron's point about restoring hope, I think that's one of the things I love about poetry is that um, it can restore, a poem can restore your hope. And even if it's just the fact that you identify with some theme or some phrase or some, some sense about the poem that lets, that draws you into, to say, you, I'm human because somebody else is going through this or this, you know, this makes sense to me. I get that. Somebody sees what I see. Um, so poetry as play, as rebellion, as calling out or calling in, you know, whichever you, whichever is needed. Um, I love all of those things uh, about being a poet. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like you said, it's just, you know, being in a place where you get to enjoy, you know, these times with other people, hearing their voices and, you know, like you said, Sienna, just, you know, I, I enjoy being with y'all and just the many of the poets that are here. And it's like, man, I'm glad to be alongside you. Like this, this is just, a great, great place for me. I, I love it. Like, I'm going to be doing this for life. <laughs> so. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Kashif, Cameron, Siana. Um, uh, today is Audrey Lloyd's, Audrey Lloyd's birthday. So it feels great. And Toni doing... Morrison. Woo. And Toni she Morrison. She yes. wrote a few poems in her life, but still. <laughs> yeah. Um, it feels great to be doing it on their special day today, but I thank everyone for joining us. Um, if you want to revisit this program or any of our programs, this will be posted on the Tennessee State Museum's YouTube channel. Um, our upcoming Black History Month programming will be next week and that's February 25th and it'll be part two of our historic Black Communities panel, and that also begins at 6 p.m. We look forward to having some of you join us for that. But thank you all so much, and everyone have a great evening. Thank you, Stephanie, for inviting us.